so I want to preach about the cross today and next Sunday. Um, and this morning, rather than look at, at how big the cross is, which is what we've done over the last couple of weeks, I, I want us to, to think about how small the cross is. See, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen that the cross is very big. It's, it's big enough to reconcile the world to Jesus. Christ died for all. So that's, what, six billion and counting. Christ died for all. That's huge. To reconcile the world to himself. We've seen that that Jesus' death on the cross is enough to deal with our guilt and our shame and our fear. And those enormous things in our lives that can be dealt with at the cross. And those things have defined cultures. They've defined ways of life and ways of thinking. The glasses through which people see the world. A guilt, innocence culture, a a, a, a fear power culture or a shame honor culture dominate our societies around the world and the cross speaks to those and deals with those aspects of our culture. The cross is huge. Paul, who is one of the first interpreters of the cross for us as he writes uh, Romans, Corinthians, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians and the rest of them. And he's He's under no illusions as to how significant the cross is. To the extent that he could tell the Corinthians that he determined to know nothing amongst them except Jesus and him crucified. That was the thing. That was the topic. That was the one thing he wanted them to get hold of. That Jesus at the cross has done it all. It all happened around the cross for Paul. All the spiritual blessings we have in Christ are because we have died with him at the cross and been raised with him to new life in Jesus. I want to talk next week about something around how, how we think about the completeness of the cross. Uh, but today I want us to think about how small the cross is. And it's small because, because it's mundane. It was exciting to see a crucifixion. Bank holiday entertainment. Just outside the city, the crowds would gather for bread and circuses without the bread. And they would watch this crucifixion as an act of public entertainment. But of course, it was all very normal. It was a simple and effective way to stop people rebelling, to keep people in order, to toe the line, to make sure the Romans really were in charge. It happened regularly. It was mundane. It was ordinary. It was small. And at the cross, God Almighty becomes small, very small, about as small as a manger in Bethlehem. About as insignificant as a carpenter in Nazareth. God becomes small at the cross. And Paul describes how this happens in Philippians 2. And he says in Philippians chapter 2, which is the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning. So if you've got a Bible, please, please look at it. If you can avoid Facebook and Twitter, then look at it on your phone or whatever. Um, unless you want to tweet something I'm saying, of course, and that would be a disaster. The... It says that Christ emptied himself. It says he made himself nothing, which could otherwise be translated, he emptied himself in Philippians chapter 2, in the hymn there, in the middle of the passage. Uh, verse, uh, uh, where are we? Verse 7, he made himself nothing. He emptied himself. And this passage in Philippians 2 is, is an amazing passage. It's, it's the passage of Scripture that stopped me doing a PhD. And uh, I, <laughs> when, when you leave college, if you've... Um, you never, you don't know what to do, do you? So, so if you're online for a two-one, one of the things that they they talk about is, well, we'll come back and pay us some more money and do an MA, and uh, or you could do a PhD if you can get funding. And of course, this was not having a job. This was a very attractive option. And uh, until I realised that one of my favourite lecturers, a guy called John John Bolchin, he was um, 
He was doing his PhD. In fact, he finished it while I was at college. He'd spent nearly a decade on this PhD, and his PhD was on these five verses uh, from uh, Philippians 2, verse 6 to 11. I thought, nine years. <laughs> five verses. I'm out. <laughs> So I found the best job I could and ended up here, for which I'm sure you're all very sorry. But that's, this, is, this is why, it's this passage that is why I, I never did academia. And um, I'm sure that was a massive loss uh, to, to no one at all. Anyway, um, Paul writes this hymn, which, well, I say he writes the hymn. He may not have written the hymn. He might have quoted it. We're not really sure. I mean, that's part of your PhD, whether Paul wrote it or whether he quotes it. And... Uh, but he writes it in the the con he write, he quotes it in the context of well the first few verses of the chapter here do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit but in humility consider others better than yourselves and that's a strong word isn't it that we need to be realistic about this because there's certain people who are very good at certain things. You are probably very good at one or two things. Paul isn't saying here that, that if you can play guitar really, really, really well, that you're meant to consider other people as better at playing guitar than you are. That's just rubbish. He's not talking about gifts. He's not talking about abilities. He's not talking about intellect. He's not talking about anything that is an attribute of you except the fact that you exist. And so he's saying, value each other higher than you value yourself. Put the other first. Consider the other more important or better than yourselves. Each of you, as he's writing this, he's just thinks of the most amazing example that he could. And he says, each of you. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Who, and this is the beginning of the song that he quotes, who being in very nature God, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself Sorry, let's read it from the version I've got on the screen. Something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, or he emptied himself. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Ping! No, lost it. <laughs> Sorry, just thank you. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You can do a PhD on this because it's so deep. You can, you can argue whether equality with God means that there's a, tr uh, a hierarchy within the Trinity or not. You, you can consider what grasping hold of the glory of God, whether that means that Jesus had something that he wasn't unwilling to let go or whether he had the temptation to try and grab something he didn't have and instead cho chose the lower path. You, you can think about what Christ emptied himself of and so forth. But the gist is that Jesus on high emptied himself himself emptied himself that somehow he left that glory and made himself nothing and to the extent that he was in nature God he became in nature a servant he was found in human likeness like us just like us human like us but not quite like us because he's God with us God incarnate 
I think it was C.S. Lewis said that the Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of men can become the sons of God. Like us. And he goes still lower. He gets still smaller. Still he empties himself. Makes himself nothing. Servant. Human. And becomes obedient to death. Even death on a cross. That's a fascinating phrase, isn't it? Obedient to death. Even death on a cross. The Lord Jesus was consciously aware, continuously, that he was doing the will of the Father throughout his life. He was obedient to the Father even to the point of death, the temptations that we read about in the wilderness are temptations that he had throughout his life, but they come into sharp relief at that moment in the desert where he was hungry and and he's tempted to turn stones into bread, where he's tempted to jump off the pinnacle of the temple, where he's tempted to bow down and worship Satan in order that he might have comfort and fame and power. And yet he refuses all of those temptations in the wilderness. And now he's obedient to death. The temptation in the garden pulls together that uh, and brings into sharp relief the temptation that he carried throughout his life to abandon the plan and to do something that was more comfortable, something that was easier, something that was more acceptable. And he says in the garden of Gethsemane, not what I want, but what you want. And here on the cross, Jesus is tempted to despair, tempted to self-justification, tempted to, to call on legions of angels, tempted to come down from the cross, tempted to pl- abandon the whole plan altogether, tempted to act against his own character that involved sacrifice and self-giving. But because he loved, he was obedient to death. Because he loved God, because he loved his Father, because he loved you, because he loved the world. And as our old hymn writer said, he emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Did I say Siri? (laughs) Modern technology, that's good. (laughs) the cross is a demonstration of the love of God there's a shrinking a getting smaller in nature God God makes himself nothing empties himself becomes human becomes a man becomes a servant becomes one who is crucified dead on a cross And of course, the Philippian hymn writer is is absolutely right. There is no more humiliation. There's nowhere lower to which you could stoop than crucifixion. Crucifixion is designed to make you small. It's designed for maximum exposure. Designed for maximum humiliation. It's designed for maximum pain. And so every rebellion leader would be crucified. Just to show how weak and pitiful and shameful and and how much of a victim he, and it normally was a he, really is. And of course Pilate had recognized that somehow. That this is God on a cross. Talked about this last week. The image of God on a cross. So powerful. Powerful because we can, as we said last week, kneel and see the love of God. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. The cross is the demonstration of the love of God. The lover always hurts more than the beloved. And this love is painful. The lover always makes themselves small. That's why we kneel to propose. The lover is always smaller than the object of their love. The beloved is magnified and the cross is small. 
Love normally involves sacrifice, normally involves humility, normally involves vulnerability, normally involves making yourself small. And God does all of these things at the cross. Because the cross is small. Pilate points to the beaten Jesus, who he just had whipped with the cat of nine tails that had ripped the flesh off his back. And he clothes him in a purple robe and sticks the crown of thorns on him. And he says, behold the man. And we know that as we look at that man, we see God with us. And the priests, the priests think this is another messianic pretender who claimed to be the son of God and was guilty of blasphemy. And now he's exposed, pitiful in defeat. And we know this is God with us. God incarnate. God on a cross. And the Romans think this is a so-called king of the Jews, another rebellious upstart who's now hanging, stripped of all his fake power. And we know that this is God of gods, Lord of lords, king of kings. And the crowd think this is a common criminal, a lowlife crucified for their entertainment and as a warning to everyone else. And we know this is God himself demonstrating what is truly at the heart of God. A heart that's filled with pain. A heart that's filled with love. And it's a small, seemingly insignificant event on some hillside outside the city where there were hundreds of crucifixions, all but a few absolutely forgotten. And while the Roman soldier thought this one was different, we see Jesus. And we see how God has shrunk. We see how God has shrunk and in that shrinking, other things are magnified. One of the things that's magnified is is the sin and the anger and the pain and the shame and the hurt and the rebellion. And we see that in glorious technicolor around this small cross. As all the hate and the hurt and the guilt and the fear, all the shame, all the pain is poured onto Jesus. Because at the cross as God becomes small. These things are magnified. And the other thing that's magnified at the cross is not only my shame and my guilt and my fear and my pain and my horrors and all the stuff that's been done to me and all the things that I've done that I regret and all the things that I carry that spoil me and wreck me and ruin other people and cause so much hardship and anger. And we see that at the cross. But we also see the love of God magnified there. We see the love of God again in glorious technicolor. We see the one who had said, greater love is no one than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends and yet he demonstrates a greater love. We see the love of God expressed in the cross. See how He loves you. We see the love that reaches out to a lost world and says, come home. Come home. I mentioned last week that I had a bit of a revelation about the cross a few years ago said about it then, so you might have. And it's simply this. Wood is expensive. That's it. I I don't know if you've ever noticed this. If you've done decking. (laughs) Ian. (laughs) 
<laughs> Ian takes Mandy's off, which is a very wise thing to do. And um, he, uh, you know, the idea is that he has a Sabbath, time to meditate and to pray and to think things through, maybe to read a bit, go for a long walk, go down to the beach, walk his dogs, all of that. Ian, what did you do on your day off? Decking. <laughs> 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 we had a glorious moment about a month ago when he came back on Tuesday morning and um, I, said, I said, Ian, did you have a good day yesterday? And he said, yeah, it was great. Lorraine said we're not going to have any more decking. <laughs> <laughs> I need to apologise to Ian, actually. It's great to have him back. He was away last week and he asked me to do one thing. He asked me to just not look after, but just be at the men's breakfast just to make sure that it all happened. Four o'clock yesterday afternoon, I remembered. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm sorry about that, Ian. Um, I was half expecting the guy still to be at the breakfast because <laughs> no one had said, should we go through to this room and, and worship and pray and, and hear from Chris? Uh, but obviously someone did. So, uh, yeah, they weren't. It. <laughs> I'm sure it was very good. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, wood is expensive. And uh, you either, it's expensive because you, there is no wood in, in Israel. Um, in Israel, you get, you get olive trees. And uh, olive trees, olive trees are amazing. Olive trees produce the most amazing olives. And, and those of you who know about olives know that these are incredible things uh, that generate all sorts of heat and light. And they also do flavor and they're just really expensive and it's just fantastic. Olive trees are amazing. Olive trees are amazing because they last hundreds and hundreds of years. And in fact, the ones that you can go and see in what might well be the Garden of Gethsemane uh, may well be a couple of thousand years old, which means they might actually be the one under which Jesus sat when he prayed his prayer. I mean, that's just amazing to go there and see these gnarled olive. And that's the clue. They are gnarled. They're all little, sh you know, they're, they're stumpy little things with, with bendy branches and, and you can't make decking out of them. <laughs> the other wood that Israel's famous for is vines. Now, if you're privileged enough to have grapes growing in your garden, you will know that, that if you can get a vine that's more than six inches thick, you've done very well. Well, I say very well, you've just not looked after it for a long, long time. Because you don't get wood in Israel, which means that wood is really expensive. You did get wood come over in the ships with the Romans, which was used for building material. But if you're going to build a palace for a, a, a king, why waste that wood on a crucifixion? When there are vastly better ways of killing people. Cheap as well. Because I've already got a sword. And that has led a few people to think a few things. And one is that, um, one is that it wasn't a big cross. It was perhaps a small stake, a whipping post. And the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that. And, uh, and, and it, what it does is it, it puts the, the crucifixion in Pilate's uh, backyard where Jesus was whipped. And that doesn't seem to make sense to me. So I don't think it was a whipping post. Some people suggest that it might have been a, a stump of a tree somewhere that you would use and they, Jesus would carry the crossbeam through Jerusalem and they'd find something maybe of olive or maybe of uh, imported wood or a bit that was left over from the building site and they'd make the, the prisoner carry the cross through the city and go to this uh, maybe dead tree somewhere that they would then crucify Jesus on. Other people suggest that, that it was a big cross, that they used really good wood. And Jesus, in, as in all the pictures, carried the cross through the city and then up to the hill. And then they stretched Jesus out on the cross and they nailed his hands through his wrists to the cross beam. And one nail through both ankles to the upright. Then they lifted the thing up. And it drops into the hole and every bone in Jesus' body was racked with pain as the thing jarred as it hit the bottom of the hole. I don't know which of those is true, but I do know that if you want to balance someone who's five foot five in the air, you don't do it 12 foot in the air. 
you do it 12 inches in the air. If you've got to crucify someone on a cross beam across a dead bit of tree, you don't do it 15 foot high. You do it 15 inches high. If you're crucifying someone, that's probably not what it looks like. Because I tend to believe that the Romans wouldn't have crucified Jesus above the crowd so everyone can see him. I tend to believe that the Romans were much more likely to have crucified someone six inches off the ground so everyone could look in his eyes. That everyone could spit in his face. That the soldier could easily put a spear through his side. I did a bit of research around this when I started to think about it a few years ago and I found out that hyssop, which was the thing that they put the sponge on to lift up to Jesus, hyssop grows to a maximum of 18 inches, which means you can't reach. That's a brilliant devotional picture and a really helpful idea. But it changed the way I look at the cross when I started to think that Jesus may well have been at eye level with me when he was crucified. Which means that I can look at him. It means I can look at him at the cross. means that I can hear the Father forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. It means I have to duck when I go round to the back. How small is the cross? I think you can look at his eye, into his eyes as you contemplate his love. I think you can see him there, nailed to the cross. How low, how small. And the last cry from the cross is, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit because it's at this lowest of places the smallest of spaces that Jesus cries out in intense hope in intense trust and with intense prayer as he puts himself into his father's hands in the hope that God will vindicate him. And he simply says, I'm giving it all to you. And from that small space into that small space, God acts. They take Jesus down from the cross and put him into a tomb. They seal it. It's dark and cold and small, and God acts. In our reading, in the hymn, in the Philippians, there's not much about resurrection. It's not really mentioned, but God breaks in. Peter says that God raised him to life because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. John's gospel talks about Jesus being lifted up. Lifted up on a cross, lifted up into the tomb, lifted up in resurrection, lifted up in ascension into glory. And in this hymn, Paul tells us, God exalted him to the highest place. And gave him the name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. 
and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So this morning I simply invite you to come and contemplate how small the cross is. To come and worship the God who makes himself small. Come and see the love of God expressed in humility and powerlessness and vulnerability. To come to the cross and receive his love. And next week we'll think about how this Jesus fills all things. Because he's been raised, lifted up, exalted to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Let's stand, shall we? Rob, where's Rob? Come and help us. Father, I thank you that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And thank you that at the cross we can see the love of God. Thank you that at the cross we're amazed. Our God contracted to a span incomprehensibly made man and yet even lower as he's crucified before us and in that place our sin and our fear and our guilt and our shame is magnified and yet your love is magnified even more and in that place our guilt and fear and shame and It's taken. As Jesus absorbs all of that into his body on the tree. And there he pays for our guilt. He demonstrates his power made perfect in weakness. He takes our shame. That he breaks every curse. That he shows the heart of the Father. And we worship you, our crucified King, our crucified God. Thank you for the cross.